I'll conclude with this. A close relative of the great Muslim apologist Ahmed Didat told Josh McDowell that on the day before his death, Didat requested that he bring him a copy of Josh's book, More Than a Carpenter. So, he brought a copy to Didat, who then read portions of it. Didat was apparently having second thoughts about Islam and was taking another look at Jesus. Didat was apparently having second thoughts about Islam and was taking another look at Jesus. Um, you know, how, how is Jesus going to return? Is he going to return? Yes, I believe yeah. Jesus said he's going to return. Um, how is he going to return? I, I don't know. Uh, or what, what I mean, you know, what's it going to look like? When's it going to be? I have no idea. If Jesus didn't know the day or hour, I'm certainly not going to know it. And the earliest Christians, including Paul, uh, at least for a while with Paul, uh, before writing Second Corinthians, in you know, by the time you get to the mid 50s. It appeared that these earliest Christians believed that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. And by the time he got to the mid-50s, Paul was seeming to come to the realization it was probably not going to be within their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. But it, there they were, you know, the words of Jesus still echoing in, their, in the air at that point. The people who had actually heard him, most of them still alive. And the way they interpreted Jesus was that he was going to come back within their lifetime. It was that clear to them, and then they changed their minds on it. So if they were confused and they were that close, I, you know, I just don't know that I'm going to be able to know that kind of stuff. The third criterion is that the book should not have a failed prophecy. Deuteronomy 18.22 says that if a prophet speaks something and it doesn't happen, don't listen to him. In short, that is a false prophet. Now it turns out that there are, new, there, there are passages in both the Old Testament and the New um, that uh, predict something and then it doesn't happen. For example, Paul, writing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, speaks of Jesus coming back in Paul's own lifetime so that he is included among the we who would be taken up into heaven when Jesus returns. And of course, this did not happen. It is a failed fail prophecy. And on this criterion, the Bible fails. Where did the modern religious right come from oh. using this kind of persecution language? Wow. Um, well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm neither American nor, nor a specialist in modern America. So I couldn't really say, but the rhetoric is sort of continuous. Part of it's actually in the New Testament. Jesus predicts that Christians will be persecuted. Right. And so Christians say, well, see, Jesus told us that we would be. What's interesting is that when you look at the specifics of those passages, 
a very different picture emerges. So um, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, defend me in courtrooms, and some of you who are standing here will be alive when I return. Right. Now, clearly... After one generation, that starts to That's go, not true. Whoa. We know that the doctrine of the Trinity took a couple of hundred years to develop. Uh, Christians got together in the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, and at that time they ruled that uh, Jesus is very God of very God. And they said, we also believe in the Holy Spirit, but they did not say anything about the Holy Spirit being God or that the Holy Spirit should be worshipped. They had to come back uh, in the Council of Constantinople in 381, and that is when they ruled that the Holy Spirit should also be worshipped along with God the Father and the Son. So that shows a development in the doctrine. If you go back even earlier to the Apostles' Creed, which is from the second century, it doesn't even say the Son is to be worshipped. So now we have three creeds, the Apostles' Creed, second century, uh, Council of Nicaea, early fourth century, uh, Council of Constantinople, late uh, fourth century. So if you see the development, only one God here, Apostles' Creed, second century, only the Father is God. Second uh, uh, of these we have in the Council of Nicaea for early 4th century, now the Son is also God. Now we have two. Uh, later in that century, Constantinople, now the Holy Spirit is also God, now we have three. So it goes from one to two to three. It goes from Unitarian to Binitarian to Trinitarian. And uh, still, I say Trinitarian with some qualification because the idea that the, how these three can still be one, that this took more time to be worked out. That does not mean that some of the earlier church fathers did not have some inkling of this. Yes, there is development. I've already seen, I've shown that this development started even with the Gospel according to John and even before the Gospel according to